In this video, we start to take a look at inference for numerical data. So in our first example, we're going to do a vocabulary check. In a matched pairs experiment, subjects pushed a button as quickly as they could after taking a caffeine pill and also after taking a placebo pill. The mean pushes per minute were 283 for the placebo and 311 for caffeine. Is each of the bold numbers a parameter or a statistic? Since both values are from an experiment, not the whole population, both of these values are statistics. Question B. The Bureau of Labor Statistics announces that last month it interviewed all members of the labor force in a sample of 60,000 households. 8.9% of the people interviewed were unemployed. The bold font number is a statistic because it comes from a sample. The sample is the 60,000 households. It's not everyone in the country. Question C. A study of voting chose 663 registered voters at random shortly after an election. Of these, 72% said that they had voted in the election. Election records show that only 56% of registered voters voted in the election. The bold font number is a parameter. So the bold number is the 56%. That comes from election records and it's data from all registered voters. So all registered voters are the population, not a sample. Question D. Scores on the mathematics part of the SAT exam in a recent year were roughly normal with mean 515 and standard deviation 114. You choose a SRS, remember that stands for simple random sample, of 100 students and average their SAT scores. If you do this many times, the mean of the average scores you get will be close to, still close to 515. So when we do a sampling distribution, the mean stays the same. Uh, when we're taking 100 students, we know that when we take 100 students and average their scores, the distribution is going to become more compressed or more narrow because the average of 100 students is going to be much closer to the population mean than uh, just the score of one student but the mean, the center value, still stays the same. Question E. Scores on the mathematics part of the SAT exam in a recent year were roughly normal with mean 515 and standard deviation 114. You choose an SRS, so again, the same simple random sample, of 100 students and average their SAT math scores. If you do this many times, the standard error of the average score you get will be close to. So here we think about the standard error formula for numerical or quantitative data. We know when we're sampling that the distribution is going to become more compressed because the mean score of 100 students is going to be much closer to the population mean than individual scores for single students. And so our formula is to take the standard deviation and divide by the square root of n, or the square root of the sample size. In this case, the sample size is 100 students, so we take that population standard deviation, 114, and divide by the square root of 100, and that works out to be 11.4 because the square root of 100 is a 10. So the standard error shrinks when we compare it to the standard deviation, and here's our formula right here. SE is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Question F. The number of hours a light bulb burns before failing varies from bulb to bulb. The distribution of the burnout times is strongly skewed to the right. The central limit theorem says that, so we want to look at these three answer choices and figure which one matches what the central limit theorem says. So we can rule out option A. It says as we look at more and more bulbs, our average burnout time gets ever closer to the mean. So that would be uh, the law of large numbers, not the central limit theorem. Uh, Answer choice B we can rule out. That says the average burnout time of a large number of bulbs has a distribution in the same shape, strongly skewed, as the distribution for individual bulbs. Well, we know that's not true because we know if you take a large enough sample, the sampling distribution becomes close to normal shape. So the correct answer is choice C. The average burnout time of a large number of bulbs has a distribution that is close to normal. And then uh, I put a note here, for quantitative data, if the sample size n is greater than or equal to 30 sample size, we expect a sampling distribution that's roughly normal. We saw that when we did uh, the simulations in the previous chapter, so we know that 
30 is a good rule of thumb for how big the sample size should be for quantitative data. Example two, we are going to look at applying the law of large numbers. So according to the law of large numbers, if we keep on taking larger and larger samples, where the samples are random and representative of the population, the statistic x bar, which is the sample mean, is guaranteed to get closer and closer to the parameter mu, which is the population mean. If we are able to keep measuring more subjects, eventually we will estimate the mean value very accurately. So question A tells us there are twice as many slot machines as bank ATMs in the United States. Modern slot machines are video games with flashy graphics and outcomes produced by random number generators. Gamblers still search for systems in hopes of winning big, but in the long run, the law of large numbers guarantees the gambling house 5% profit. A friend who knows you are taking a statistics class text messages you that she just won $100 at a slot machine in Reno. Should your friend spend her $100 playing more slot machines? Explain the best advice to text back. So here's what I would text back. Don't do it. Stop gambling. Keep your $100. So in the long run, your friend will lose 5% of the gambling house because the gambling house takes 5% for profit. So if your friend puts in $100, we expect just to get $95 back. So our friend is better off just keeping their $100. Question B, the idea of insurance is that we all face risks that are unlikely but carry a high cost. Think of a fire destroying your home. Insurance spreads the risk. We all pay a small amount and the insurance policy pays a large amount to those few of us whose homes burn down. An insurance company looks at the record for millions of homeowners and sees that the mean loss from a fire per year is mu equals $250 per person. Most of us have no loss, but a few lose their homes. The $250 is the average loss. The company plans to sell fire insurance for $250 plus enough to cover its costs and profit. Explain clearly why it would be unwise to sell only 12 policies. Then explain why selling thousands of these policies would be a safe business. So if we check 12 policies times $250 is only $3,000 total. This is not enough to cover even one house burning down. Uh, thousands of policies should cover at least a few houses burning down. And we've seen in areas with wildfires or in the 1991 Oakland Hills fire, when you have a lot of fires in one area, if insurance companies haven't sold diverse policies all around the state or all around the country, uh, they can run into financial trouble as insurance companies. So after the 1991 Oakland Hills fire, uh, they put into place some laws about how insurance companies needed to sell policies in uh, bigger areas so that if a fire did come through, they would have enough policies in other areas. So now that we are working with quantitative data, or we can call it numerical data, when we set up a hypothesis test that claims our statements about a population mean, we will see that the steps in the logic of the hypothesis test are the same structure as for proportions.